And I love the song selection today. Victory, talking about victory, and yes, I will. And There are days where we won't feel like it, but the truth of the matter is you are forgiven. Grace is always better than guilt. And there is unlimited grace for you. Your salvation is stronger than any sin you've ever committed. You find freedom at the cross. And anything in your past is wiped clean. You have a new slate, white as snow, the Bible says. And Satan knows this. And so he is going to do everything he can. He knows who wins. He knows the end of the story. And so do you. And you, as a follower of Jesus, are on the winning team. And so the encouragement for us today is stop living in the past. You, my friend, as a follower of Jesus, you're responsible for today and tomorrow, but not yesterday. In Jesus, you have been forgiven. And Satan knows that. And so he is working over time to accuse you, to remind you, to bring things up of your past. And let's not live in the woulda, coulda, shoulda world. Amen. And so today, as you heard from the passage that was read already, we're, we're dealing with a, a really fun passage today. I, one I've never heard taught on. And we're going to look at it today. Jude, thank you to Janet for reading our passage. And if you'd like to read scripture, you can sign up online. It's an opportunity for us to get to know different members of our congregation while raising the importance and the significance of the public reading of God's word. In Revelation, there's a passage in Revelation chapter 12 that describes who Satan is. In Jude, we're introduced to this character of Satan. And in Jude chapter 12, verse 10, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, John writes, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and our authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. In Jude, verse 8, Yet in like manner these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Who's he talking about? The context is men within the church. He specifically calls out men in the church who are causing problems. And so he says, yet in like manner, then he, verse 9, But when the archangel Michael contending with the devil or Satan or Lucifer, was disputing about the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. What's happening in this passage? This is a kind of a crazy passage. We're like, Jude, do you have ADD? You're, you're like jumping all over the place. I can relate to Jude. But I feel like he has limited amount of ink. He's, he's tackling a whole lot of things here. So we have in this short little passage, Michael the archangel, and we have Satan. Satan, I just read in Revelation 12, he is called what? He is called the accuser. And John writes in Revelation 12 that day and night, our enemy, Satan, never stops working. He was, he was active duty all the time. And what is he doing? He is the father of lies. He is throwing accusations against you. When those thoughts come into your head, those are reminding you of decisions that you've made in the past, decisions that you made you wish you hadn't, or decisions you didn't make that you wish you had. If you've ever thought to yourself, I wonder if God really loves me. If you've ever thought to yourself, am I really saved? Have you ever thought to yourself, I shouldn't have this job. I, I, I'm in over my head. I, I, I'm not worth it. If you've ever had any of those thoughts and the list goes on and on and on and on, that is, as a follower of Jesus, those thoughts are not of God. They are of Satan. Satan is accusing you day and night. He is he's working overtime. And so a lot of us live in the should have, could have, would have world. And I just want to say to you as a follower of Jesus today, if you've given your life to Jesus and you have found forgiveness from your past, what does that mean? Let me just spell it out for you. It means God no longer holds you responsible for your past. There's no decision that you've made in your life where God even remembers it. So 
when you wake up in the morning and you have all of this overwhelming sense of regret and shame and guilt that is not of God, it is of the enemy. Because forgiveness, God says, as far as the east is from the west, I keep going east, I'll never go west. God will not hold that over your head. You are, you are forgiven. And so then we're told, well, where does that thought come from? Where does that, where does that lie come from? From Satan, who is the father of lies. He is accusing you. And I love the song selection today. Victory, talking about victory, and yes, I will. And There are days where we won't feel like it, but the truth of the matter is you are forgiven. Grace is always better than guilt, and there is unlimited grace for you. Your salvation is stronger than any sin you've ever committed. You find freedom at the cross, and anything in your past is wiped clean. You have a new slate, white as snow, the Bible says. And Satan knows this. And so he is going to do everything he can. He knows who wins. He knows the end of the story. And so do you. And you, as a follower of Jesus, are on the winning team. And so the encouragement for us today is stop living in the past. You, my friend, as a follower of Jesus, you're responsible for today and tomorrow, but not yesterday. In Jesus, you have been forgiven. And Satan knows that. And so he is working over time to accuse you, to remind you, to bring things up of your past. And let's not live in the woulda, coulda, shoulda world. Amen. <laughs> so what's happening here with Moses? Moses, right? It's a difficult passage to interpret. There are different opinions on this passage. I just want to be full disclosure on this. But the best I can come up with Moses, he's the pinnacle of the Old Testament. I mean, if you, were to, if you were to zero in on one person in the Old Testament, like who's the main character of the Old Testament? There's a lot of characters, but Moses is pretty high up there. First five books of the Bible, right? He, he wrote, he's the leader of the nation of Israel. Remember, remember what he said when God chose him? I, that, I, I can't do it, I can't speak. You got the wrong guy. Anybody ever thought that? God, you... I'm in over my head. I have this complex. I feel like I, I shouldn't be here. I, I feel that. Have you felt that? Moses felt that. Moses, the Bible says, had a hot-tempered anger. He was hot-tempered. He was, had a short fuse. He was going off all the time, so much so that he killed a man, right? He murdered a man. And so Satan is accusing, Right? Who buried Moses? Let me give you a little history lesson. In Deuteronomy, we're told at the end of Moses' life, it says he, he died. Now, for, for living the life that Moses lived, you'd think he would get a funeral service. Moses didn't get a funeral service. God says, I've got this. I will bury Moses. So God buries Moses. There's only one person who knows where the bones of Moses are, and that's God. Moses did not enter into the promised land. There's a whole history lesson on that. Now, Satan also knows, and we've seen this act of Satan. He knows how it ends. And so if he can disrupt God's ultimate plan, right? That's always, always trying to disrupt the plan of God. He'll fail every time. But if he can steal the bones of Moses, maybe he's thinking that Moses isn't going to show up in the future. Now, bear with me. I know some of you, you're like, I'm lost. Moses shows up in the transfiguration in the Gospels. There's a few characters, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. They go up to the mountain, and their two visitors join them. One of them is Moses, joins them. Maybe Satan's thinking, I'm going to accuse before God Moses. He's a hot-tempered man. He's a murderer. He doesn't deserve this. In Revelation, there are two witnesses that show up. One of them is Moses, we believe. We don't know that for sure. So Satan's, Satan's trying to disrupt the plan of God. God, Satan is always doing that. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you. You know how the story ends. We're on the winning team. Right. Satan's going to accuse nonstop. Now, who is he fighting against? I hear sometimes, oh, the opposite of Satan is God. No, false. 
The opposite of Satan is not God. They're not even on the same playing field. They're not on the same realm. The, the opposite of, of Satan is the archangel Michael. The archangel Michael is singular, one angel, and he is the president of the angels. He is the leader. He is the head angel, and he is a warrior angel, archangel Michael. He shows up, and he does battle. There's, there's a reference in the, the book of Daniel that says there's a battle going on, and for 21 days over the prince of Persia, there's this battle going on, and then Gabriel leaves, and the archangel Michael shows up. When Michael shows up, war's over. It's Michael's doing, doing battle. So there's a battle going on here. There are those uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Maybe that's the background you grew up in. They believe that the archangel Michael is, is Jesus. No, Michael's a created being. And so Jesus has never been created. He's always been. We believe in the eternality of Christ here at Boulder Mountain. And Michael is an angel. So there's this battle going on. What's, what's taking place here? Let me just take a moment and talk about, about angels uh, throughout the Bible. 300 times throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, angels show up. I'm sure some of you have stories. As a follower of Jesus, maybe you've, you've experienced supernatural help. Whether you witnessed someone or something or not, there's no other explanation. As followers of Jesus, we have hope even when we do not have explanations. There are times in your life, it's good to know there's always hope, even when you do not have explanations. And when we come to a topic like the spiritual world, it's important to have balance. And the two directions that we can go here today, we can go with a, a fascination with the spiritual world. And Paul warns us in Colossians 2.18, he says, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. So in, within the church, there are those who are becoming overwhelmingly concerned with the spiritual world. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions about their spiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head. Now, the head is Jesus. From the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments, grows as God causes it to grow. So there's a warning Hey, let's not become overly fascinated with the spiritual world. That's one direction. The other direction is we don't give it any concern at all. We never talk about it. And we act like it doesn't exist. So we're going to take a balanced approach. There is a spiritual world, my friends. There's a battle going on right now all over the world. There's angels and there's demons. And we're told in the Bible they're, they're fighting. They're They're active. Billy Graham says, if we could see it, the sky would be ablaze with, with the battle and the war going on. If you do not know Jesus, the Bible says there are angels fighting over your soul. Part of their existence and their role is for you to experience redemption. And we're told in Luke 15, the greatest joy, the greatest joy that an angel has is when a sinner repents. There's a party. The angels throw a party in heaven. Other things about angels, the angels, who they are. Let me just briefly mention who they are. They're spiritual in nature, but they can take the form of a human body. Angels possess an abundance of wisdom. Angels are mighty and powerful. Angels are righteous and blameless. I mentioned last week, but an angel has never been redeemed. You and I experience something that I believe angels are envious of. For you and I can sing songs like I was lost and I was found. An angel cannot sing that song. They may sing it better than we can, but they cannot sing it from the same place that you and I sing it from. We have been redeemed. Angels have not been redeemed. Let's talk about what they do. Angels worship God. It's part of their role, part of why they were created, to worship God. Revelation 5, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. I read that this week, and I pull up my calculator. 
How many is that? It's a hundred million. A choir of a hundred million angels? That's what's happening right now. So what we experience in the few minutes of singing songs is practice for that one day. We get to join in on that choir. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise day and night. And it's hard for us to even fathom that. Revelation chapter four, what does this look like? What did they look like? And around the throne, on each side of the throne are four living creatures. This is Revelation four, verse six. Four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. You thought your mom could see everything that happened. <laughs> they had eyes in the front and behind. Why? Because they're guardian angels, they're protecting the throne. And behold, the first living creature was like a lion. So John's like, let me try to explain this to you. The first living creature is a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. The four, four living creatures of each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within. All day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We get a little, little picture. One day we will experience it in reality, but for now we just get a little picture of what is happening in the throne. So angels were made and created to worship God, and so were you. Your purpose in life is to worship God. Angels are warriors. We're told throughout the Bible of times when angels show up and they do battle. In Acts chapter 12, we're told that King Herod is killed by an angel. I mean, there's no misinterpretation on that. An angel killed King Herod. This isn't the King Herod of the Christmas story. This is actually his grandson. Angels are warriors. Uh, there's a missionary in Papua New Guinea uh, about 100 years ago, John Patton, a missionary east of Papua New Guinea. He tells a story about some angelic care that he received in his lifetime. He said that one night, Wild natives surrounded his house, frantically dancing and jumping up and down the jungle, desiring to kill John and his wife. Which is, they had just replaced the missionaries who had been martyred and killed. Well, they got on their knees, realizing there was no way they could protect themselves against these wild cannibals, and they prayed. And soon after that, the attackers all vanished into the jungle, and they were gone. According to Patton's biographer, a year later, the chief of the tribe became a follower of Jesus. And John asked him at that time, hey, what happened the night about a year ago when you were surrounding our hut? And this is what the chief said. Well, because of all those men you had with you, we left. And John said, there were no men. They're just myself and my wife in the house. And the chief said that they had seen men standing guard, hundreds of big men in shining clothes with swords in their hands, totally circling his home. Did God dispatch a legion of angels to protect his servant? It wouldn't have been the first time. There is a war going on right now in the heavenly realms. We can't see it. There's more to you than what you can see. There's more to me than what I can see. There's a battle going on. There, there's spiritual forces happening and at work all the time. And if you don't know Jesus, there's a war going on for your soul. The victory is for you. The prize is you. Angels are warriors. So I think of a, the angel that went with the nation of Israel as they left Egypt and they went through the Red Sea. Did you know there was an angel leading them and, and going, going with them? Angels help and protect God's people. Exodus chapter 14, then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. I believe that God's children are protected more often than we know. And you may have stories about that. I was run over by a car when I was seven years of age. And the doctor said, there's no explanation why there is no damage to me. It's just one, one case. I have a few stories I could share. 
I believe I met two angels on a hike uh, when I was overcome with heat exhaustion. And I was out of water, I was out of food, I was in the middle of nowhere, and I was texting my wife the location of my body so they could find me. And I met, I met two men in polos and jeans, had no business being where they were. It was in June. I had no business being where I was either. And they had ice water. And they filled up my, my camelback bladder. I believe that we're told in Hebrews that be kind to people, be hospitable to people. When someone rings your doorbell, you don't know if they're angels. Be hospitable, for we entertain angels and we're not even aware of it. Angels are there to support you and help you. I believe angels can help lead us toward, toward wisdom. So what's, what's happening in this path? Hebrews 2.14, angels care for those who are to inherit salvation. Like I said, one of their roles is to help the redeemed come to, know, come to know Jesus, help people come to know Jesus. We also entertain angels unaware. He might send you, when you're in trouble, he might send you a friend. He might send you a small group. He might send you an elder, a pastor, or he might send you an angel. My friends, the supernatural world is real and angels are real. Don't give it too much credit, but don't discredit it either. This time of year when my wife and I go see a movie, it doesn't matter the rating of the movie that we're going to see, the trailers for some of the movies that are coming out, especially around Halloween, is demonic and sickening. And sometimes we want to we want to leave. And once the trailers are over, we'll come back. Be mindful of that. Not playing games using riddles when we were kids, those things, that is real stuff. You open the door to the demonic, to the demonic world. Psalm 34, 7 says, the angel of the Lord encamps those around you. Matthew 18, 10. Watch that you don't treat a single one of these childlike believers arrogantly. You realize, don't you, that your personal angels are constantly in touch with my Father in heaven. Let me read that again. This is Jesus speaking. You realize, don't you? Now, we think of that passage in terms of little children, but Jesus, I think the bigger context is his followers of Jesus are his children. You realize, don't you, that their personal angels are constantly in touch with my Father in heaven. We're told in other translations of that verse, the, the angel's eyes are on the Father, but they're protecting us. You would not want them looking at anything else but the Father, but they're protecting us. And they're, and they're guiding us. There are times where angels do not show up to help. You think of the, the apostles and the, and the gospels and in the book of Acts. There's times where angels release the prison cells, pr prison doors, and saved apostles. And there are other times they were kept in prison, they were beheaded. That is up to God to decide how and when, how and when he shows up. But we get this little picture of what's happening here in the book of Jude. In the book of Jude, as a church, we're going to be mindful of the spiritual world. A number of months ago, we all filled out some cards. If you were a part of Boulder Mountain Church that weekend, we filled out name tags of, of men and women that are in our life who we're praying for to come to know Jesus. I want to remind you of those names. Wherever you put those names, if you put them in a Bible or if you put them in your home somewhere, continue to pray for them. I believe God is sending help for them to come to know Jesus. And there is no greater joy in the heavenly realm. I wonder what that's like. I wonder what that sounds like when someone places their faith and trust in Jesus. And a hundred million angels ring out in praise. I mean, we've been to a stadium where we've heard 50,000 people cheer. Imagine a hundred million angels celebrating you. You gave your life to Jesus. That's a big deal. So pray for your friend, pray for your neighbor, pray for the lost person who doesn't know Jesus, that they would come to know, they would come to know him. I end where we begin, and that is the what ifs and the should ifs and the could ifs, because it's really important that you not leave here today, whatever you walked into the room with today, 
that you keep beating yourself up over, a decision made or not made, regrets in your life. Listen, grace is bigger than guilt and salvation is bigger than sin. In a book that I, one of my favorite books of all time, I read it when I was a kid and I've read it here recently is the book uh, Pilgrim's Progress. If you've not read that, I encourage you to read it. Uh, if you have children, read this book to your kids. It's a Christian allegory about a main character of the book. His name is Christian. It's about his journey. It was written by John Bunyan when he was sitting in prison being persecuted. John Bunyan describes a battle between the accuser Apollyon and Christian. And guess where this battle took place? In the Valley of Humiliation. We've all been there, haven't we? One of Apollyon's poise is to recite a laundry list of Christian sins. And he just continues to, to list, hey, you did this, and you didn't do this, and you call yourself a Christian, and you were a coward at this moment, and you had this long list. And Christian's response to the accuser is full of humility and faith. He says, all of this is true. Oh, and it's a lot, much longer list than you gave me. But you left one part out. The prince whom I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. And at the mention of Christ's forgiveness, Apollyon flies into a rage. Listen, Satan and the accuser cannot abide by the fact that his accusations are overcome by the grace of God in Christ. There's no accusation that is spoken to you, that is placed in your head, that is a lie that you hear, that God's grace is not bigger. There is, there is unlimited grace at the cross. There is nothing you've done well. If God only knew this, or I know he forgives me of this, but there's this other thing, that is a lie from the accuser. That is a lie from Satan. You find grace and healing and freedom from your past. In the context here of Jude, he's talking to the church. Grace is the most important thing that we can preach, the grace of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Now, what happens in this passage? The archangel says, who rebukes you? The Lord rebukes you. You and I don't rebuke Satan. And listen, if anybody thinks Satan is spending his time on you, it's, you're giving him way too much credit. Satan is not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. Now, there are, is there a spiritual world out there? Yeah, there are demons out there, yes. But every bad thing that happens to you is not the act of Satan. If you get a flat tire on the way to church in the morning, it's because you drove over a nail. It's not because Satan's attacking you. So let's be really careful when we use the word Satan. Number one, we give him too much credit and he wants nothing more than to receive the credit that he doesn't deserve. And number two, it is, it is the Lord who does the rebuking. And Michael the archangel is a pretty powerful warrior. He understood his place. It's the, it's the Lord who rebukes you in the name of Jesus. So here at Boulder Mountain, we're going to be aware of the spiritual war world. We're not going to become overly fascinated by it, and we're not going to discredit it. It's a very real thing. As you go throughout your week, be mindful of the spiritual world. If you have friends and family members who do not know Jesus, pray for them. Pray for them. I'm going to pray, and there's going to be an opportunity to come down front during this last song. If you need prayer of any, for any reason at all, our prayer team will be down front. It will be an honor and a privilege to pray with you and, and for you. So, Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture that just gives us a little picture into the spiritual world, into the spiritual realm. Father, there's a lot of things we don't understand. But, oh, that picture we get of the throne of heaven where one day we will experience that in reality. But it's not today. And so we rely on grace. Father, I pray anybody in this room who, who cannot, maybe they've received forgiveness from you, but they've not forgiven themselves, that today would be the day they would receive grace and mercy and, and look forward. And that they wouldn't continue to beat themselves up. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Father, we pray for our friends who don't know you. Pray for the battle over their soul, that they would come to know you, a personal uh, salvation.
salvation story. And we'd be celebrating that in this room in the future. For other needs and prayer requests in the room here today, Father, you know them. You know every detail. I, I pray you'd, your angels would minister in this room along with the Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.